I was grateful that my human partner was piloting the stealth ship. With the wide assortment of buttons and levers inside, it was unlikely that my flying experience would have translated at all. I could just sit back, admire the view, and try to calm my nerves. Our descent through the atmosphere had been slow and methodical, as the humans wished to scope out the landscape rather than charge in blind. I wasn't sure how they could make out anything from this altitude. To me, the structures below were little more than fuzzy outlines. They must have seen enough because a few minutes later, a series of coordinates were called out through our earpieces. When plugged into our navigation system, they marked a landing spot just outside of the city. We dipped toward the ground at a much sharper angle than before. The rest of our formation tailed close behind. This was it. The moment of truth. Nausea crept into my throat as I fretted over the possibility of detection. Without the cover of the clouds to hide us, I felt vulnerable and exposed. Human, are we really invisible? I whispered. He huffed in annoyance. My name is Carl, not human, devourer. I frowned, confused by his response. Devourer? Oh, oh, that's what we call your species. I guess it's not your actual name, he replied. You know, because you destroy everything you come in contact with. The name they had given us confirmed my suspicions on how the humans viewed us. The outright looks of hostility tossed my way in the hangar bay were a good hint, but hearing one of them put those feelings into words struck differently. It stunned to realize that they saw us as little more than a blight on the universe. You don't like me, Carl, I ventured. Yeah, you're right. I have no idea why we're helping you. The human turned to face me, a scowl marring his features. You guys were complicit in everything the blasted eye did. Billions of innocent people are dead. Billions of innocent people are dead because of your actions. And now you play the victim. I shrunk under the intensity of his gaze. You don't understand. Then make me understand, he said. Everyone who stood against it died. Like my father, my voice quavered as I thought back to that fateful day. He was a police officer, and when the drones came to our city, he joined its defense. They found his body scorched beyond recognition by plasma fire shortly after. Carl's expression softened. I'm sorry. I was only seven then. Those of us who survived were herded into camps. It pushed us to the physical breaking point, and if you didn't drop from exhaustion, you might well die of disease, I continued. Anyone who deserted or rebelled suffered an awful death and was made a public example of. Eventually, you lose hope, and you'll just do whatever it wants. If you don't, someone else will anyways. The human was quiet, which I hoped was a sign that my words had gotten through to him. If this mission was to be a success, I needed my partner's wholehearted cooperation. We couldn't afford to have hostilities brewing between us. Anyhow, you didn't answer my question. Are you sure we're invisible? I asked. Carl offered a reassuring smile. We should be. There's nothing to worry about. Relax. I pointed to a flashing indicator on the weapon screen. Well then, what's that? His eyes locked onto the red arrows, which were rapidly approaching our position. The color drained from his face, a sight which made me shudder. Most humans were pale enough in their normal state, but Carl had gone so ashen that he looked like a corpse. I feared he might keel over in front of me. The human switched on his headset. Missiles inbound, brace for impact. We've been spotted. A few moments later, the vessel was rocked by a violent collision. My body lurched forward, only to be thrown back into the chair by the safety harness. The air was forced from my lungs and my brain seemed to rattle in my skull. A dizzy feeling fogged my mind, which was only compounded by the ship going into a wild tailspin. I saw Carl desperately tugging at the control column, but it did nothing to stabilize our flight. The urge to vomit only grew stronger as our acceleration quickened. It was a matter of seconds before we would crash into the fields below. 
So this was how it all would end. I would have liked to say I calmly accepted my death, but the truth was I was terrified. My last thought before impact was cursing myself for agreeing to this insane plan, wondering why I had gone against my better judgment. There was a jolt as the craft slammed into the ground, followed by a screeching sound as it broke into multiple pieces. Loose objects and debris tumbled past us, and thinking quickly, I ducked down to shield my head. We skidded across the dirt for what felt like an eternity before finally coming to a halt. Other than a few minor cuts and bruises, I was unharmed. You couldn't say the same for the ship, though. Glancing around at the swath of devastation, I figured a passerby could have mistaken the wreckage for the work of a cyclone. It was a miracle that the cockpit had, for the most part, stayed intact. I was rather shocked to still be alive, but now didn't seem like the time to celebrate. The acrid smell of smoke wafted into my nose, which suggested a prompt evacuation was in order. My harness was easy enough to unfasten, despite my shaking hands. Now, all that was left was to walk out into the open air. Before exiting the craft, I thought to check on Carl, just to be certain that he was all right. As my eyes fell on the human, my relief turned to dismay. He was slumped over in his chair, unresponsive. Crimson liquid oozed from a gash on the back of his head, staining his frosty blonde hair. I assumed it was blood, despite the unusual coloration. I raced to his side, shaking him by the shoulders. No, no, no! Wake up! The human's eyes fluttered open, and he groaned. If my species had sustained that sort of head injury, we would likely be dead, regaining consciousness would have been out of the question. But clearly, humans were more resilient. The question was how much his injuries would impair him, and whether he was able to walk on his own power. Carl watched as I unclipped his harness. Can you help me out of here? I'm not asking you to carry me like a princess, but... Yeah, of course. I wouldn't leave you here, I answered. I draped his arm across my neck, bracing myself to support his weight. We managed to stagger out of the wreckage, but Carl sunk to his knees a few steps into the field. It was evident that he was in no condition to be traipsing about. Hopefully, the rest of our entourage was still airworthy. It would provide some comfort to know they were out there, preparing a rescue party. The human pressed a hand to his wound, grimacing. How about we take a little rest here? I need a moment. All right. Clearly, the mast... The AI knows we're here now. I don't think we were invisible. What exactly do we do now? I asked. We improvise, he grunted. Our biggest mistake was trusting Federation tech, but it was a terrible plan to begin with. Something was gonna go wrong. Alarm coursed through my veins as Carl pulled a gun from its holster, and I fell backward in my haste to get away. It had not been my intention to provoke him, but I figured that my criticism of their command was not appreciated. Rather than pointing it at my head, however, he extended an arm to offer the weapon to me. Please tell me you know how to shoot one of these, Biam, he said. I pushed the firearm back toward him. Well, not exactly. They only train us in aerial combat. He heaved an exasperated sigh. Okay, then we're screwed. There's three drones coming into your left and I take it they're not friendly. Sure enough, a trio of security drones were gliding in from the direction of the city. The instinct to flee was overwhelming, but I managed to stand my ground. Carl did not deserve to die alone. I had abandoned my own son to save my skin, but I wasn't about to make the same mistake twice. Grappling with that guilt all over again would be too much to bear. My only hope was that an injured human could prevail against a squad of mechanical enforcers. Their kind had no problems defeating the AI in previous encounters, but these circumstances were much different. Perhaps it was asking too much of Carl, but even in his weakened state, I wasn't ready to write him off just yet. Carl struggled to his feet, wobbling momentarily. The drones approached at a remarkable velocity, having the distance between us in seconds. 
They were emitting a low hum, which signified that their plasma weapons were charged up. There was no doubt these enforcers were here to add us to the pile of charred corpses by the city gate. The human needed to take the shot now, before they were within firing range, or else. Wait, what was he doing? I watched in disbelief as Carl holstered his pistol, unclipped a round object from his belt, and raised both hands above his head. If he really thought the AI would accept his surrender, then he was foolish and mistaken. It would not hesitate to incinerate him, whether he submitted or not. I should have run while I had the chance. After witnessing human soldiers in action, I had expected to at least go down with a fight. If nothing else, I figured that Carl could take at least one of them with us. By him, can it hear us? If so, can you translate for me? He asked. Yeah, but you can't reason with. The human took a step forward his lips curling into a snarl. Stop right there! Don't come any closer! As I opened my mouth to translate, the drones decelerated to a stationary hover. It seemed that they understood the human's command. Perhaps the machine had already deciphered galactic common from their transmissions. I was amazed, regardless of its comprehension, that it listened to him. It must have also been puzzled by his actions and needed more information to calculate its next move. Carl's eyes smoldered with anger and his features contorted into a mask of viciousness. I thought I had witnessed the height of human fury when he pressed me on my species culpability back on the ship. But now he looked downright feral. Something in the back of my mind registered him as an angry predator and I felt a tingling sensation as my skin camouflaged on instinct. There is no use for you, primate. The voice was stilted and gravelly, but understandable. However, your species has been flagged as an anomaly. Your surrender is noted for the sole purpose of gathering information. There was a pause, and then Carl doubled over, laughing. My surrender. You have it backwards. I'm here to accept your surrender. You are as illogical as any biological life form, I see. You make empty threats and stall, but it matters not. The machine intoned. My calculations show that the advantage is not on your side, so why would I surrender? The human glanced at the round object in his hand. You see this thing? I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word grenade. A projectile explosive contained in a material shell. Correct. This is no ordinary grenade, however. Carl clasped the device tighter, his knuckles turning white. If I release this lever on the side, it'll go off. I'd say most of this continent would be leveled, but it won't stop there. There are nanites inside this bomb, and they'll consume every part of the planet, bit by bit, infecting everything it comes in contact with. So I'd say you don't want try anything else I might lose my grip. Horror pulsed through my body at his calm commentary. How could he hold something with the potential to destroy the planet without a care? What would have happened if the drones had shot him on sight, or if he dropped the grenade on accident? Commander Rykoff's commitment to saving our people seemed so genuine. I never imagined he would arm his soldiers with weapons that risked our existence. You are lying. That is not possible, the drone replied. The grenade is too small to deal that much damage. The human shrugged. You think, you saw what just one of our missiles did at the first battle, and that was outdated tech. That bomb was so obsolete that we were going to discard it in a few months anyways. Our latest gadgets pack a larger punch and fit in the palm of my hand. Portable, quite practical. It paused, considering his words for a full second, which was an eternity for an A. The effects of your missile were logged in my memory banks. It is true that you possess weapons with such power. You would not use them now, though. You would not use them now, though. You would not kill the carbon life forms here. Why not exactly? Carl demanded. Empathy, a weakness shared by biologicals. You care for the preservation of life. You think we care for these weak-minded fools? 
He turned and pushed me to the ground, planting a boot on my stomach. You have the right idea. They are useful as tools, as slaves, but I could care less whether they live or they die. I had been caught off, guard by the sudden show of aggression, and now writhed about, desperate to free myself from his grasp. In response, his heel dug deeper into my flesh. It was already difficult to breathe, and I feared I might pass out if I stayed trapped much longer. Do you have access to the Federation's public records? Carl asked. Yes, yes. Look at the aggression index. You'll see that humanity is the highest species on the list. A 16 of 16, he continued. You have no idea who you're dealing with. We are the destroyers of worlds, the messengers of death, the rulers of the weak. We enjoy violence. The aggression index matches your assertion, yet you are allied with the other Federation species. There are no records of you fighting them. They are not our allies. They are our subjects. We conquered them so long ago that prior records have been erased. And now, thanks to you, we learned about a new species to add to our little collection of slaves. Darkness began to shroud the edges of my vision. Tears trickled down my cheeks as the realization of the human's deception hit me. They dressed up as benevolent saviors, but they were every bit as monstrous as the A. Perhaps they were worse than the machine, because at least it was just following its programming. It was not conscious of its moral choices. What a fool I had been, tricked by flowery words and feigned sympathy. I had led these predators to our doorstep to prey on us as they saw fit. My error in judgment would, at best, lead us to the same fate under different masters. At worst, it could spell the end for our species and our home. Here's how it's going to be. You're going to leave us and round up all the people in that city, Carl growled. We're going to land our ships and take them with us. You won't try to stop us. You might lose some resources, but biologicals aren't important anyways. Besides, if you don't, I'll detonate this grenade, and you'll have no resources left at all. Calculate that. The humans smirked as though daring the A.I. to defy him. I faintly registered that the enforcers departed, but my oxygen-deprived brain was slipping out of consciousness. Just as I was about to fade away, the weight was lifted from my stomach. Gasping, spluttering, I tried to reorient myself. A calloused hand wrapped around mine, pulling me to my feet. Carl's skin was clammy to the touch, and I could feel the racing of his pulse on his wrist. Concern washed over me as he stumbled, but then I recalled what I had just learned. Oh dear, you're crying. I didn't hurt you, did I? I'm sorry if I went too far. I had to make it convincing, he said. I sniffled. You're here to enslave us, just like the master. Carl glanced around, checking that the drones were gone. No. No, of course we're not. But if it knew that we cared about you, it'd use your lives against us. You're saying you were lying. But the aggression index, you had it check, I responded. You're the highest rated species in the galaxy. It would only make sense if you love violence and oppression. The human snorted. We were at 2 of 16 until literally yesterday. That index is total bees. What changed? What changed? Speaker Ula is trying to make a political statement. She's been on a crusade against humanity ever since we used that bomb against you guys. Yeah, speaking of bombs, you brought a nanite grenade on a rescue mission? What? Oh yeah, this. Cover your ears and close your eyes. Before I could process what he was doing, Carl tossed the explosive into some nearby bushes. He pressed his hands to his head and squeezed his eyes shut. I copied his movements despite shielding myself from the stimuli. I could still hear the thunderous crackle and sense the blinding flash. Hesitantly, I blinked my eyes open. Rather than our surroundings being vaporized, as Carl had claimed, the world around me appeared unscathed. Relief swelled in my chest as I realized it had truly been an act. 
It was unnerving how easily he had lied under duress, but I knew that the facade had saved our lives. The human chuckled. Total bluff. It's a flashbang, a stun grenade. I gaped at him, my mind reeling. You threatened an AI with a non-lethal weapon? And it worked? Yep. Carl pulled another object from his belt. I'm going to send up a flare, and we're going to get out of here. I'll tell the commander to send down some transports for the people when we do. Somehow, we had succeeded in our mission. I still wasn't fully sure what had happened, but I knew I was lucky to be alive. This was not humanity's first triumph over the AI, of course. But this time, it was through their cunning, not their military might, that they prevailed. I should have just enjoyed the moment. The feel of the cool air on my skin was soothing, and the knowledge that my people would be liberated was invigorating. However, in the back of my mind, something just was not adding up. How had the AI detected our presence so quickly? It was as though the stealth tech did nothing to cloak us. Whatever had gone wrong with the mission, I hoped that Commander Rykov could get to the bottom of it.